In Job chapter number 26, we find that Job has uh, had one of three of his friends come and uh, really be a blessing to him. If you know the story of Job, Job lost everything in one day. He lost his flocks, he lost his finances, he had ten children taken away from him, he went to ten funerals in one day, and even his own flesh uh, developed boils. Uh, 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 you know the story, Satan came before the throne of God accusing the brethren like he has some of you this week. That's why you face some of the adversity you face this week. The devil's told the Lord, well, if you let me uh, 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 just penetrate the hedge you got around them, let me just discourage them a little bit, they'll have enough. They won't care about that revival meeting. God said, have at it. Hmm? And that's why some of you face some things this week. Well, he was accusing the brethren, and God got tired of him whining. And God said, hey, have you considered my servant Job? Uh, Satan said, no, you've hedged him in too good. You've blessed him so good, there's no way that he's going to uh, uh, turn from you. And uh, the Lord said, we well, can have all his stuff just to save his life. And uh, he did. He took all of Job's possessions, and that didn't work. And he went before uh, the Lord again. Satan did, and he accused Job. And he said, uh, 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 let me do this. Let me have his life. He said, you can have everything but his life. So then he taxed Job's uh, uh, flesh. And, and you know the story. Job's in the ash pile. He's miserable. His wife tells him, curse God and God die. And uh, 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 he said, hey, woman, you're crazy. You talk like one of the crazy women said, hey, uh, is it uh, to receive the good things of God and not to receive some bad things of God? He said, naked I came in this world, naked I'm going out, blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, and the Bible said, in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Amen. Well, Job, you got to understand, he didn't have the Holy Ghost living inside of him, Brother Donald, like you do. Right. Job didn't have a co complete copy of the Word of God in his lap like you do, Brother Clint. Matter of fact, chronologically, Job is the first book of the Bible. And so he didn't have the Bible, he didn't have the Holy Ghost, and here's another thing, Brother James, nowhere in all of this until the end of the book does God even speak to Job. He didn't have a promise like Abraham did. All Job had is confidence towards God. Well, Job had three friends who cared about him. they come to check on him. Uh, listen, I appreciate that they did check on him. Nobody else came and checked on him. And his wife told him to curse God and die. But these three friends, let me just summarize it this way. Do you ever have one of your children drive you nuts? And then somebody that doesn't have children going to tell you how to raise your children and take care of your children? Well, that's Job's three friends. They didn't, they, all three of them didn't know enough about God to fill up a thimble. But they're telling Job through all this ordeal that he must have sinned, he must have done something horrible. God would have never done this had Job been right with God. And so Bildad here, one of his friends, has come, and chapter 25 is all Bildad telling Job and trying to bless Job out and tell Job how rotten he is. And in chapter 26, Job begins to answer Bildad to let Bildad know he don't know as much about God as he thinks he does. So I just want to pick up down about verse number 6, and we'll read the next eight verses. I want you to see what the Bible says. The Bible says, Hell is naked before him, and destruction hath no covering. He stretcheth out the north over the empty place, and hangeth the earth upon nothing. He bindeth up the waters in his thick clouds, and the cloud is not rent under them. He holdeth back the face of his throne, and spreadeth his cloud upon it. He hath compassed the waters with bounds until the day and night come to an end. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his reproof. He divideth the sea with the, his power, and by his understanding he smiteth through the proud. Uh, by his spirit uh, he hath garnished the heavens. Uh, his hand hath formed the crooked serpent. Uh, Lo, these are parts of his ways, uh, but how little a portion is heard of him. Uh, but the thunder of his power, who 
can understand. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for all the good singing. We thank you for the good testimonies. Lord, we do pray for Miss Janet that, God, you would touch her. Lord, I pray that she would get to come to services this weekend. You said through the psalmist uh, that, Lord, you'd give us our heart's desires. Uh, and, Father, her desires to be here for this weekend's revival meeting. Uh, and, Lord, I pray that you'd touch her. I pray that uh, 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 the surgery on her toe wouldn't be that bad. And, God, that she would be able to come out. And, God, I pray that you'd bless her heart's uh, desire to even come out even if it's impossible for her to make it. And Father, I certainly do pray for Brother Lucas. I'm glad, Lord, you touched him. Lord, I hate to hear he had a seizure, but Lord, I'm glad that you brought him through it. I'm glad he's here tonight, and what a blessing that he was praising the Lord. Uh, Father, I do pray for Miss Brandy that has surgery next week. Miss Debbie has surgery next week. Uh, uh, Lord, I pray you touch them and be with them. Lord, I certainly pray for the Schneckenbergers be traveling. You'd give them traveling mercies. Uh, Father, there's a lot of things going on in a lot of people's lives. Uh, Lord, people have had to contend with the world. Uh, they've had to contend with the flesh. Uh, Lord, they've had to contend with the devil. Uh, uh, there's been everything from flat tires to headaches to backaches uh, uh, to traumas uh, uh, to all kinds of things. Uh, but I'm glad your people are in the house of God tonight. Uh, I'm glad many of them said they want more. Uh, I'm glad, Lord, that you're willing to grant more. Uh, and Father, I'm glad that, God, you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think. Uh, now, Father, I do pray you'd bless your people. I know many have worked even today. Uh, it's very hot outside. Uh, uh, Lord, the pressure on people uh, uh, just living their daily lives and working on their job. Brother Phil talked about a guy smarting off to him today. Uh, Lord, folks are facing things, uh, but they found themselves in the house of God tonight. Uh, I pray you'd refresh them. Uh, I pray you'd revive them. Uh, I pray that you would strengthen them. Uh, I pray that you would elevate them. I pray the message... Uh, Lord, would certainly encourage and edify and enlighten their minds. Uh, may you prepare us from tonight uh, to be ready for Friday, uh, and may you get great glory. Uh, Father, we always pray if there's somebody unsaved that they'd get saved tonight. Uh, and we certainly pray for the saints of God. Uh, you'd revive us again, uh, and you'd do great and mighty things which we know it's not. Uh, bless now, use this unworthy vessel. Uh, we'll bless you and praise you for what you do. Uh, for it's in the holy, the wonderful, the glorious name of the Lord Jesus we ask it all. Amen and amen. I want to draw your attention to several things as a way of introduction. The first thing that we see in this chapter uh, is the omniscience of God. In verse number 6, Job says, Hell is naked before him, and destruction hath no covering. We see that God is all-knowing, and God knows it all, friend. Mark her down. There is nothing that is hidden from him. Can I help you with something? Long before you had your bad day, God knew it was coming. And right now, whatever's going on in your life, God knows it. God knows all things, and He knows what we stand in need of. We see the omniscience of God. We see the omnipotence of God in these verses. Uh, notice uh, uh, His omnipotence, that God has all power. We see the precision of His power in verse number 7. He stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. Now tell me that that isn't God. Hmm? We see uh, 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 how precision God is. God in his power knew exactly how to put this earth on axes and spin it so gravity would keep us where we are. Hmm? God in his power mm, is very precise in how he does things. He's very distinct. He's very detail-oriented. Now, that doesn't seem like it excites you. Aren't you glad he didn't put your nose in your armpit? I'm glad he's very detail-oriented. Oh, well, hallelujah, you're here with me tonight. That's a blessing. God is very precision. We see that in the Scriptures. We see in his power, he's not only precise, we see the perplexity of his power. Look in verse 8. He bindeth up the waters in his thick clouds, and the cloud is not rent under them. Now that's perplexing. I don't know if you've ever been in an airplane and went through a cloud, 
but there's nothing to it. But yet he'll fill the thing up with water and it doesn't break it. Now think about that. I mean, it's like cotton candy. You take some cotton candy and you fill it up with a, a, a bunch of water and see what happens. You're going to have a mess on the floor. But not when God does it. Hmm? In his power, he's per precise, but he's also perplexed. We also see uh, uh, the privation of his power, or how private he is about it. Look at verse number 9. He holdeth back the face of his throne and spreadeth his cloud upon it. Your God, in all of his power, knows to stay behind the shadows. You see, if God did something in the sky, then people would worship him because they saw him. But we're to walk by faith and not by sight. God doesn't want people to trust him because of what they see. He wants them to trust him because of what he says. Adam saw him, but Adam didn't listen to what he said. And that's why we got the problem we got in the world today. We see not only that he's private with his power, but he's also, we see the production of his power. Verses 10 through 13, it just talks about some of the things that he does. And only God can do. And you can read those again on your own. We see the omnipotence of God. We see the omniscience of God, but... We also see in these verses the obscurity of God. Look at verse 14. Lo, these are parts of his ways, but how little of a portion is heard of him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? Solomon said that this way, quoting Sheba, he said that the half was not told. We just know a little bit about him and we can't comprehend it. He's so obscure. His ways are past finding out. His ways are far above our ways. Uh, our little finite pea brains can't comprehend who he is. Uh, but uh, what little bit I know, I sure do enjoy. Uh, and what little bit I've seen out of him, uh, I sure do appreciate. Uh, and what few times he's walked by and touched us in his place, uh, it has overwhelmed me. Uh, and I say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, I want to focus on something I read in verse number 11. Verse 11 says, The pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his reproof. Uh, my Aunt Lynn is sitting back there tonight, and one of her all-time favorite messages that I ever preached was found out of Jeremiah chapter number 10. And in verse number 20 of that chapter, the Bible says, My tabernacle is spoiled, and all my cords are broken. My children are gone forth of me. They are not. There is none to stretch forth my tent anymore and to set up my curtains. Uh, God is pining through Jeremiah. God had, had earlier said, Woe is my grief. Truly it is a grief. I must bear it. Uh, 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 God saw what he was going to do even in Jeremiah's days uh, in bruising the darling son of God and allowing him to go to Calvary to pay our sin debt. Uh, and God seeing how good he'd been to Israel but now there's no one to stretch, uh, stretch forth the curtains in the tents of his tabernacle uh, uh, to raise it up to worship him. Uh, they've all gone astray. Uh, and what God was saying, there were no more pillars uh, in the church. And that message I preached so many years ago that my Aunt Lynn loves uh, uh, was entitled Pillars in the Church. Uh, and in that message I brought out uh, uh, that we need pillar preachers. Uh, aren't you glad there's still some men of God uh, uh, to just pin their ears back uh, and preach what thus saith the Lord. Uh, uh, they'll just preach what God says. Uh, I'm so tired uh, of hearing about human philosophy. Uh, I'm so tired uh, of emotionalism. Uh, thanks be unto God, there's still some uh, that can open this black Bible, black, black Bible, uh, and stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord, uh, and begin to preach, uh, and begin to let us know and exhort what the will of God is for our lives. 
Pastors, uh, we need pillar preachers uh, in that message. As uh, I bring out, we need pillars of prayer. Uh, thanks be unto God, there's still a few uh, who can grab the horns of the altar, uh, who can get a hold of God, uh, who can move heaven toward earth uh, by calling upon the name of the Lord. Uh, Caleb, uh, I keep praying for revival, son. Uh, uh, all we've experienced, I believe, uh, is because you had a burden for it, uh, and some of you other young people had a burden for it. Uh, uh, keep praying. Uh, keep asking God to send it. Uh, we need some pillar of some prayer. Uh, hey, to be a pillar of prayer, you just got to believe God will. Not that He can, uh, but He will. And we need some pillars of prayer. Uh, also in that message, I mentioned we need pillars of praise. Uh, the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Uh, we need some that will sing. Uh, some that will shout. Uh, some that will say so with the touch of God on it. Uh, Whoa, we need some pillars. In that message, I bring out some pillars you can become. You can become a pillar of silver. Silver is always a picture of redemption. Uh, uh, by being redeemed, you qualify. Uh, uh, but not only that you're redeemed, uh, uh, but you want to uh, redeem the time that others can get saved, get regenerated, get born again. Uh, pillars of silver. Uh, uh, you can be a pillar of iron. That's what God told Jeremiah to make him. Uh, uh, just someone who's steadfast. Uh, somebody's faithful. Uh, somebody's just planted themselves right in the middle of the Word of God uh, and they're going to stand on it. Uh, they're going to let, let the world know uh, it don't matter if it's COVID. Uh, doesn't matter if it's the devil himself. Uh, they're going to stand up and be accounted for for the things of Christ. Uh, Need some pillars of iron. There's too many wishy-washy Christians in this day and age. Uh, and that message I bring out, uh, uh, you can be a pillar of fire. And my dear friends, uh, 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 bring out that analogy when uh, uh, the children of Israel uh, well, uh, come out of Egypt and they get down to the Red Sea and they begin to murmur to Moses, would to God we died in Egypt and you let us out here uh, and all of Pharaoh and his army comes uh, 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 breathing down their neck uh, and the pillar that led them out there, the pillar of fire goes behind them and stays Pharaoh's army. And then Moses echoed those words, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. God parted the Red Sea. Uh, they went across on dry, dry ground. Uh, uh, then God allowed the pillar to be dispersed uh, and Pharaoh pursued after them and God closed up the Red Sea and he drowned all of Pharaoh's army on that day. Can I say, sometimes the Ray, we need somebody who's a pillar of fire, somebody that's on fire for God uh, so the weaker ones in the faith can get to safety while the devil's contending with them. Huh? And can I help you with something? A pillar of fire isn't worried about the enemy. A pillar of fire is so close to God, the enemy doesn't concern him. Hmm? Uh, you can be a pillar of fire. There's also a pillar of cedar. And I had scripture for all these. I'm not re-preaching that message. I'm just helping those that hadn't heard it. But cedar's always a picture of faith. Give us some people of faith. People that just believe God. I crack up every time I come down Camp Ernst Road. And there's that sign out there. Fear is contagious, but so is faith. Well, we know who the vineyard uh, has their faith in. They're all fearful. They haven't even had service yet. Why in the world would you have a banner out there uh, about how faith is contagious when you don't have any? Uh, uh, and then they say, we're all in this together, you bunch of cowards. Uh, hey, blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, there's some who put their faith in Jesus. Jesus, uh, and they just believe he's able to take care of them. Uh, Paul said, I'm persuaded he's, a I mean, he's able to take that which I've committed unto him uh, against that day. Hey, uh, I just believe God's able, huh? Had somebody ask me this week, y'all having church? Yeah. Y'all shaking hands? Oh, more than that, we're hugging necks, whopping slobbers, doing all kinds of stuff. Anybody got sick? Oh, yeah, we're sick, all right. <laughs> we got that Dr. Phil virus back there, huh? We just, we just uh, uh, fell in love with Jesus and can't get over it, huh? But then there's our pillars of uncertainty. Paul said of James and John, he said, whom seem to be pillars. There are some who are active, but they're not fruitful. Hmm. They seem to be pillars. They say the right things. They're always there. They always do. But there's not much fruit. 
And then, of course, we know Lot's wife turned into a pillar of salt. Yeah. Amen. There are some who desire sin more than the thought of being saved from their sin. And that's that message on pillars. And pillars we need in the church. But I was reading the Word of God the other day. And verse 11 says there's pillars of heaven. And so with God's help tonight, I want to preach on the pillars of heaven. I mean, we've seen what kind of pillars there are in the church and what kind of pillars you can become and what kind of pillars we need. But what about pillars in heaven? It intrigued me. And I began to seek the Lord and began to study and began to look at some things. Uh, and let me tell you about the pillars of heaven. Can I say these pillars consist of, first of all, celestial beings. The Bible says in Revelation 5.11, And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. Now, uh, let me help you with a few things about angels. An angel is a ministering spirit that God uses to accomplish what God wants them to accomplish for Him. Now, angels are created above us, Brother Clint. We're created lower than the angels. But we're not to worship angels. Hmm? Uh... Where you work, do you have janitors? No. Do you have anybody that cleans up around there? At night. At night, yeah. And, you know, the boss tells them what to do. Do you all come in and worship the ones that clean up and do what the boss told them to do? <laughs> You're just thankful no, it's clean, which probably ain't real clean because you work in a shop. But, I mean, you know, you're thankful they did something. Right. Yeah. Uh, why would you worship an angel? All over Christianity, people got little angels on everything. And they just, Billy Graham wrote a book about angels. And everybody loves angels. And, and everybody's all about angels. Well, you're looking too low. You need to listen to the angels. There are angels called seraphim. You only find them in Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, and there's uh, uh, these seraphim have six wings. Uh, 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 two wings cover their eyes, two cover their uh, uh, face, and two they fly, or two cover their feet, and two they fly with. Uh, and all these angels do is fly around the throne of God. Uh, and all they do is cry, Holy, holy, holy. Uh, uh, the angels are saying, Don't look at me. Uh, uh, they're saying, We're not even worthy to look upon him. Uh, uh, but to one you need to look to. Uh, all we can say about him is he's holy, holy, holy. Uh, hey, uh, there are cherubim. Uh, uh, cherubim were placed at the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were cast out. Uh, and cherubim uh, uh, stand before the throne of God uh, and they show God's presence uh, but the unapproachability to God. Uh, uh, and friend, nobody is going to approach God uh, uh, unless they have an avenue. Uh, and that avenue approach God is the the blood of Jesus Christ uh, and you and I have been washed in the blood uh, we now have an advocate with the father uh, uh, a mediator the man Christ Jesus uh, and we can go right into the throne room uh, because of the blood uh, but those that aren't saved uh, will never get to God uh, because of them cherubim uh, hey them cherubs are the ones uh, that came down and wiped out the whole Syrian army in the night uh, they're bad dudes you don't want to mess with them uh, and God's got other angels. Uh, uh, but hey, uh, they're just pillars of heaven. Listen, I know I'm going to bust. I ain't even talking to you. You done messed everything up, Pete. <laughs> Listen, nowhere does it talk about angels being these little cute, little cupid looking things. Nowhere does it say they run around half naked. Uh, no, nowhere does it say they got little bows and arrows and little harps and all that. You know what? I, that's all made up. It's not what angels about. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell us to worship angels. And while I'm on my angel kick right here, the Bible does not say that angels rejoice over a sinner that repenteth. 
Nowhere say, go back and read the book of Luke. It says that there's rejoicing in the presence of God over a sinner that repenteth. It's not the angels. The Bible says the angels look in unawares. The angels don't know why Jesus died for you. The angel looks at you as just a glorified mud pie and say, why would the Son of God go down and live amongst them? He's holy. And why would He die the death on the cross for that? They don't understand why why God loves you, why God listens to you, why God gives you the time of day. Angels could care less whether or not you get born again. All they care about is Jesus Christ and glorifying Him. But I got news for you. There is rejoicing in the presence of the angels. Who's doing the rejoicing? The darling Son of God. Every time somebody gets saved, He jumps up and says, It was worth it. It was worth it. It was worth it. Hey, the saints of God that have gone around and went on before us. Every time somebody gets saved, when He gets a shout, it's worth it. They get the shout, and it's worth it. It. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Hey, what a blessing. Well, I got to move on. I'll never get this thing done. We got the celestial beings. They're pillars of heaven because they are used of God so that He is glorified. Can I say, also in heaven, there are creatures around the throne that are, my dear friends, pillars of heaven. The Bible says again in Revelation chapter 5, verse number 8, it says, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts. Now, this is part of that half that isn't told. I don't know who they are. I don't know what they are. I don't know why they're there. All I know is that they're there. Because I believe the book. But the book, and how many times have you heard me say the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible? This is what the book says about the beast. Over there in Revelation chapter 4, verse 7. And the first beast was like a lion. And the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had a face of a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts, each of them, had six wings about him. Uh, and they were full of eyes within. Uh, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 uh, Lord God Almighty, uh, which was uh, and is uh, and is to come. Uh, now, uh, there are a lot of people that speculate and want to give you types of what these beasts are. Uh, they're like Bildad. They don't have a clue. Uh, all I know uh, is there's four beasts in heaven. Uh, and one of them looks like a calf. Uh, one looks like a lion. Uh, one of them looks like a man. Uh, uh, listen, and the other one looks like a flying eagle. Uh, they each got six wings. Uh, they're full of eyes. Uh, maybe they're ones that are making sure everything's being recorded, that everybody does. I don't know. But they're paying close attention to something uh, if they're full of eyes. Uh, but all I know, uh, uh, their job in heaven uh, is to do this. Uh, they cry, uh, holy, uh, holy, uh, holy uh, is the Lord God Almighty, uh, which was uh, and is uh, and is to come. Uh, hey, uh, uh, that's a pretty good job. Uh, it'd be all right with me. God said, I just want you to tell everybody how holy uh, I am uh, and how long I'll be around. Uh, well, he was, uh, he is, uh, and he is to come. Uh, he's Alpha, Omega, beginning uh, and the end. Uh, same yesterday, today, uh, forevermore. Uh, that's him, uh, and he's holy. Uh, I said he's holy. Uh, he's holy. Uh, say, preacher, why they keep saying holy three times? Uh, once for the Father, uh, once for the Son, uh, once for the Holy Ghost. Uh, they're holy. Uh, and these creatures around the throne are pillars in heaven. I'm going somewhere. Hang with me. We find their celestial beings. There's these creatures. But then can I say, there's the crowned. 
the crowned. Revelation 5, verse number 8, goes on to say this. And four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb. There's four and twenty elders, or twenty-four, around the throne of the Lamb that are pillars in heaven. You say, who's that crowd? I do know who that crowd is. Twelve of them are the sons of Israel, the twelve tribes of Israel. And the other twelve, uh, see those were the uh, uh, God's government under the law of the Old Testament. Uh, but in the New Testament, his government is the church. Uh, and he had twelve apostles. Uh, Hey, uh, and those thrones are for those 12 apostles. Uh, by the way, the 12th wasn't Judas. The 12th the Apostle Paul. Uh, and they're all around the throne. Uh, and they're there representing how God uh, uh, ministered grace through the ages uh, uh, to make a way where fallen man could get to God. Uh, hey, what a blessing uh, uh, to have those 24 elders uh, as pillars in the church. Well... I thought of some other pillars in the church. Another pillar in the church are the cloud of witnesses. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 12 says this, Wherefore seeing we, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Well, who's that crowd? Well, that's the redeemed that's went on before us. Huh? Hey, Brother Phil, that cloud's filled with your mama, your daddy, and your darling wife, Miss Judy. They're in that cloud of witnesses. Huh? Miss Lynn, your mama and daddy, my mama, your sister, uh, 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 they're in that cloud of witnesses. Uh, are you listening? Uh, that's that redeemed that's went on. Uh, uh, they're there. Uh, and God, every now and then, I believe, Brother James, uh, when you get to singing and God gets to touching, uh, uh, the Savior looks up at your mama and says, there's your boy. Uh, he's a singing. Uh, aren't you glad you taught him about me? Uh, he's a, you being used by me to bless. Uh, hey, that cloud is around his throne. Uh, mm. And I got to think about some more pillars of heaven. That's what we're preaching on. The pillars of heaven are the church of the living God. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 3.15, But if I tarry long, that's Paul speaking, not Jesus. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. And by the way, there's a right way and a wrong way to behave in the house of God. You're right. That's why sometimes I have to instruct some of you. Because everything's be done in decent and in order. And we've got the scriptures to teach us how to act in the house of God. We also got to teach the scriptures teach us how to act outside the house of God. But he said that thou mightest know how to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Who's the truth? Jesus. Who's the pillar and ground of the truth? The church. How does the world know the truth? Through the church. Hmm? Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. And can I say, God uses the church to impact the world. Anything that bypasses the Lord's church, God's not interested in. Because Jesus loved the church, gave himself for the church. He uses the church. What a privilege to be a part of his church. Uh, what a privilege to have a church here on this little hill uh, uh, where folks want to meet with God uh, and where God wants to meet with his people. Uh, and what a blessing to come around and see what God does around here. So I have named with, for you just five pillars of heaven. Pillars that God is building things upon and using to impact the spiritual world and the physical world. Now let's go back and read our verse again. I'm almost done. A couple of you look like you're about to pass out. I'll help you here. Not really. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Verse 11 says, The pillars of heaven, notice, tremble and are astonished at his reproof. In other words, it is saying they are shaken and stunned. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his reproof. Who are you talking about? I'm talking about the celestial beings, the angels. 
I'm talking about the creatures, the beast. I'm talking about the crown, the four and twenty elders. Huh? I'm talking about the cloud of witnesses. All of them are in his presence right now. And when God reproves them in his presence, they are astonished and they tremble. And then the fifth one is the church. Now what are they... What, what causes them to be stunned and shaken up? Can I say they're shaken and stunned, first of all, at His presence? Yeah. Revelation 1.17 John the Revelator said this, And when I saw Him, I fell at His feet as dead. When John on the Isle of Patmos saw the glorified Christ, he fell at His feet as a dead man. Can I say God has been walking through here quite a bit lately? Yeah. Has it shaken you up? Have you been astonished? I'll be honest with you. I can't even describe. And there's been times when he's got so real up here, I have to go back there. I can't even describe what he's doing around here. How did you describe last Friday night? Here's all I can tell people. God. What happened? God. He happened. They are stunned and they are shaken at His presence. Can I say this? The pillars of heaven are shaken and stunned at His pronouncing. The Bible says in Job 37, 5, God thundered marvelously with His voice. Job 49 says, Hast thou an arm like God, or canst thou thunder with a voice like Him? Hmm? We find in verse 14, it ends with saying, But the thunder of His power, who can understand? When God pronounces, His voice is like thunder. Or the revelator said, His voice was as many waters. Have you ever been around somewhere like Niagara Falls where you can't hear yourself think because of the noise of it? When Paul was saved on the road to Damascus. Saul of Tarsus, uh, those in his company thought it thundered. When God spoke about Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, uh, those in the crowd thought it thundered. When God speaks, does it shake you up? Does it stun you? I'm tell you, he's been speaking around here. Can I say they are shaken and they are stunned at his power? Daniel chapter number 3, you know the story. Three Hebrews wouldn't bow, wouldn't bend, wouldn't burn. They told the king, now nah, stick it. We're just going to trust God. Mm. But COVID says you got to wear a mask, not me. But COVID said that you can't, you can't, you got to be socially distant. So go ahead and help yourself, not me. But the governor said you can't have church. You know, fear's contagious, but so is faith. Verse twenty-four. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished or astonished. And rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the, unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. For the fourth of the form, uh, for the, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Amen. See, when the power of God is demonstrated, the pillars of heaven trembled and are astonished now I don't know about you but seeing a prodigal of nearly 30 years jump on a pew and run down a pew and jump off and dive in I'm telling you I was standing right here right here bless God I was right here and I look over and I see Austin hit the altar so I turn to go help him before I can get from here to here that fella runs down a pew his daddy is down here getting right with God that should astonish us. Yeah. 
Can I say? All of heaven is astonished and shaken when they see the power of God and what pow the power of God does to convert a sinner. Do you realize before ever, anyone's ever saved, they need to realize they're lost, but do you realize what God does in a, in, for a lifetime to bring them to that place? Yep. Ray, one day you might have woke up and realized you was lost, but it didn't take God a day. It took God a lifetime to get you to that point. He'd been working in the shadows and orchestrating and doing everything, and that day in that bend of the road in that 57 Chevy when you called on God... All of heaven was astonished and trembled that God can save a nobody from Stanton, Kentucky and a 57 Chevy. Hmm? When he converts a sinner, they're astonished and they tremble. Can I say this? When he is, uh, when he compensates one of us, when he awards us, or blesses us, or elevates us, they're astonished. They tremble. That God, you only got to realize his sides are in the north. That means everything is beneath him. And we can just through some of them telescopes just see our galaxy. They say there are galaxies upon galaxies upon galaxies. And when you put in perspective galaxies upon galaxies upon galaxies and the millions or billions or gazillions of stars that he's hung out there and called them all by name, by the way. And he looks through all of that, all the Milky Way and all the black holes and all the wormholes and all the stuff that science says that's out there. And right out in the middle of all that's this little speck called Earth. And on that little speck called earth are 10 billion people. And he uh, uh, goes all the way through all those 10 billion peoples to come where you are and bless you yeah. and elevate you to stand up and say, I want to praise the Lord. Yeah. Well, you see, you, you're looking at it from the wrong perspective. You're just looking around. You need to see it from their perspective. They look at it and say, what, what are you talking about? That little, what, that little place called, that's where you're interested in. That little planet, and on that little planet, the little hill in Florence, Kentucky, that's where you're going to show up. That's where you're going to touch somebody's life. That's where you're going to change life. That's where you're going to elevate somebody to shout, to, uh, to glorify God, to, uh, to cause a preacher from Owenton to run laps around the building. Uh, that's what you, they tremble astonished uh, that God would even care that he would convert that he would compensate bless or elevate or that he would even continue to put up with folks like you and I aren't you glad for that he's long suffering to usward not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But aren't you glad God's put up with you? Do you realize from their perspective, that crowd crying, holy, holy, holy to him, when they look at us and how unholy, unholy, unholy we are, they would say, go ahead and throw them off into hell. They said, well, you don't understand, my blood's been applied. Don't matter, look at them. Look at you. Look at them. Why are you putting up with them? But you see, there's a love covenant and a blood covenant. And then there's the promise covenant. And he's not going to break any of them. See, they don't understand that. And they tremble. And they're astonished that God honors his word honors his love for you and I and honors the blood that he shed for you and I above even his own holiness well, the real question is the pillars, pillars of heaven they tremble and are astonished at the workings of God here's my question do we Preacher after preacher after preacher has talked about how dry it is out there. How they aren't seeing anything happening. Are we astonished? Do we tremble at the workings of God in this place? 
the pillars of heaven do. God help us if we don't. All that God's done around here since May 25th, 21st. And there's still some that aren't even broken, haven't got involved. You ought to be astonished and tremble. We ought to tremble walking in. I walk in here on Monday and start weeping just because I know God's here. Brother Ray come out here and done some work yesterday. He told me today, he said, I come out here and he said, I just couldn't help it. I just started weeping because God's here. And yet we'll come in and we'll trample on God's carpet in God's house and we'll just sit in here and we'll talk a bunch of junk before church and we'll, do, we'll, we'll be interested in what Dr. Fauci says and we don't care what Jesus says. We ought to tremble and be astonished that God even allows us to come through those doors. Let alone that He's going to work in our midst and touch hearts and touch lives changing these kids lives do you realize some of the things that some of you got saved out of they won't have to face because they got saved before they entered it that is the workings of God that ought to astound us it ought to cause us to tremble and shudder in our bones that I don't, I, I don't want to mess it up I don't want to grieve a holy God I, I dare not enter his sanctuary in vain I don't want to take for granted what he's doing I want to come hungering and thirsting and longing to see him do it again now how did you enter the house of God tonight since you come through those doors has your conversation been holy or has it been fleshly has your aspirations been holy or have they been fleshly? My dear friends, if all of heaven trembles and is astounded at his reproof, how much more should us glorified mud pies that aren't even worthy to call upon his name outside the blood of Christ tremble and be astounded at who he is and what he's been doing around here? So I ask you, have you had enough? It's now up to you. Miss Renee, come to the piano and just play something. While she's playing, I'm going to pray. Let's all stand. Father, we love you. Thank you for the scriptures. Lord Bill Dagg, in his ignorance, he didn't know what he was doing. God, most of what we do, we do out of ignorance because we can't understand how great and how precious you are. But God, we are glad the scriptures let us know you wink at our ignorance. God, you have been so real and so rich in this place. God, forgive us for not trembling and being astonished at the workings of God. God, thank you for the ones you have saved. God, thank you for the ones you have restored. Thank you for the ones you have enlightened. Lord, they've grown so much closer. Thank you for those you have changed and transformed. Those that used to wouldn't come out to pass out tracts, but now they're coming out. Those that used to wouldn't have testified, now they testify. God, thank you for what you're doing. And yet all that you've done, there's still some that don't consider the lilies. They don't consider the workings of God. Lord, I'm reminded when you used Moses to part the Red Sea, it was in no time they was murmuring and complaining. Time and time again you do something miraculous, whether it be water from a rock or manna from heaven. And yet they would murmur. When we ought to be trembling, many times, God, we're murmuring. So, God, we pray you'd forgive us. Forgive us of our short-sightedness. Forgive us of our uh, lackadaisical attitudes, our fleshly-mindedness. God, I pray we'd have the fear of God in our soul. You are holy, and we bless your holy name. 
Now bless now in this time of invitation. Shake us up. Stir us up. And then Father help us to look up to the author and finisher of our faith. And we'll bless you for what you, what you do in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.